It's Sunday night, and we're talking about deception and being deceived. Only the believer can be deceived. We've gone through, there are two particular Greek words that are used throughout the New Testament. Uh, The word plane, plane, and the word apate. These words, when they're used, they mean deceive, and of course, those of you that are watching, you haven't seen us before. I'm talking about the original Greek text. That's what the New Testament was written in. It was not written in English. So it wasn't any English 2,000 years ago. So, plane, that word plane uh, means fraudulent or straying away from orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is what is upright thinking. Ortho means straight. And doxy means doxa or dokin means upright. What is right thinking? It means to stray from thinking right or understanding, thinking correctly. And we've been talking about that, thinking correctly. And it has the idea of to to uh, deceive or delusion or error, error, and uh, to delude. When you delude somebody, you make them think you're telling the truth, you make them think something that's not true by your convincing, flattering, easy talk. And you have several variations of this word plane. You have planos, and that means an erratic teacher or a, an imposter, a, a good counterfeit, a counterfeit. Imposter. I keep saying, if you're a really good imposter, uh, you can pass yourself off as something you're not. An imposter would be the same thing as a hypocrite. Or hypocrites is the Greek word. It means an inferior judge or one who can't judge correctly and you're interpreting something for yourself. It was an interpreter of a role, R-O-L-E. It was actually a stage actor in the first century. One who wasn't telling the truth. He was putting on a mask and pretending to be something he wasn't. A stage actor. So that's what you are when you're an imposter. And to have a really good imposter, a man's got to be really good. There was an old movie years ago called The Great Imposter. I believe that was the one that Tony Curtis was in. And it was about a real man that did everything from he uh, would pass himself off and he would get credentials, pass himself off, he'd get him a... He would get a uh, a doctor's manual. He'd read through it. He had a real good memory, and he'd remember all this stuff. And he'd remember a lot of things, and he passed himself off as a surgeon. He even got on a ship, uh, a military ship, and did an operation. And he never had done anything like that. Men that are, but he was so good at what he did, he would study up on doing something. He would pass himself off. As a military man, as a doctor, as a as a airplane pilot, he would actually read things and learn to do stuff on his own. Well, it doesn't mean that he was one. He just was passing himself off. And you have when somebody is really good at being a good actor, an imposter, that's called being a con artist. And it's really difficult for a simple minded person or someone who's ignorant, ignorant, or a baby, if they're babies or they're children. Babies or children. Children can be led away. These are the people, these are the people, if you're a baby believer, you haven't developed, you're, you are in for, uh, to be led away. You're more of a candidate to be led away than somebody else. In fact, it's real difficult to fool an old pro. You just can't do that. It's hard to do it. Well, that's what that word means. It means an imposter. It takes 
it takes somebody really good to recognize a counterfeit bill. Counterfeits, if they're really good, and that's the only thing that can deceive people is a good counterfeit. Well, you got counterfeits all over the America. You've got Kenneth Copeland. You've got, I don't think he's that good. I don't know why in the world people even want to follow him. You got Benny Hinn. You got Fred Price. You got uh, all these guys, Creflo Dollar. What a name, Dollar. He's a crook and he's always stealing dollars from people. Uh, and then you have uh, Billy Graham, Charles Stanley. They preach, accept Christ. They're really good imposters. If they weren't, they wouldn't have hundreds of thousands of people following them. You can't have that many people following you and not be good at it. But the reason people don't know that Billy Graham is a liar is because he looks real good and he looks respectable and he talks like he knows what he's talking about. And then he does all this lying like accept Christ as your Savior, let Jesus come into your heart by your own free will, pray a sinner's prayer. Uh, all of that is not true. He doesn't believe in predestination. He does not believe... He believes in Christmas. We don't believe in that. It's That's paganism. That's Roman Catholicism. It's Christ's Mass. I don't know why it don't occur to people to stop and break the word down to Christ Mass. Well, those guys are really good. Billy Graham is the greatest imposter in preachers in the last 2,000 years because he has reached more people than any preacher that's lived since the days of Jesus and he tells lies. And people will say, you can't say that about a Billy Graham because he's a wonderful man of God because he talks about Jesus and God and saved and salvation. And he's got lies all through that. Be certainly faith is true and salvation is true and saved is true, but it doesn't happen the way he says. And the stuff he says is not true, but he sounds real good and he says flattering words when he does it. That's why people don't recognize him as being the false teacher that he is. But he is. And let me tell you something. Eternity will reveal that. Then you have another word that's related to that planet taste. We get our word planet from that. A planet is something that's wandering around a heavenly body, usually a star, or it can be our moon wandering around the earth. And this planet taste means a wanderer. That's a person that wanders here and there, goes a little bit of everywhere, and it means someone who's erratic in their teaching. And you have the word planel. And planel means to, to lead somebody out of the way, to deceive or to err, lead them out of the way or the narrow way, and take them over into the broad way. Now, we've been talking about the doctrine of the devil. And what we've started doing, the devil, there's no such thing as demons. Demons are self. Jesus said so. Now, if you want to know about that, go online. If you've got a computer, go online. Look at graceandtruth.net. And then you, we've got a whole series on the doctrine of the devil. We do not believe in demons. We believe they are self. Because we get the word demon from the Greek word D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. And that word daemonion comes from the root dio, meaning to distribute fortunes. And I keep saying this, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. Love of money, philogoria, H-I-L-A-R-G-U-R-I-A. A-R-G-U-R-I-A, which means a love, a philos, an affection for shining augury, and or, a, or an affection for silver or shining. Now, the whole, not just the shining of silver, but when you shine above others, that's because you've got lots of money and you're wanting to decorate yourself and look, people look up to you. Now, We've been talking about the other words for, we don't believe in demons. Demons are self. Jesus rebuked the man in Mark, the first chapter. The Bible says Jesus rebuked A-U-T-O. The word is self. It's self that he rebuked. He rebuked him. Sometimes that word auto, which is the word 
which is the word self and automobile being self-mobile, sometimes depending on the A-U-T Ada would be her, they don't have pronouns the way we do. Sometimes they will translate uh, ho, te, to. Uh, ho, te, and to, these are the words the, the, that would be the, masculine and feminine neuter under the singular, masculine and feminine neuter under the plural, and then nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative case. Well, ho is in this masculine section. That's the word the, the. And sometimes they will take this word masculine, feminine, the, and translate it him or his. You have to understand, they don't, they don't have the same language we have. Sometimes they will translate auto, he, in the Greek text, and they'll tra translate aute, which is feminine gender, they'll translate that she or her, depending on the case and so forth. And ho, hey, to. This is neuter gender. Well, this is the, to is the, the neuter, the desk, desk. Hey is feminine. The girl and ho is masculine, the boy. But you see, in the Greek, they didn't have to have desk, girl, or boy. All they had to have was ho, hey, to. And that meant when they saw this the, they saw this the right here, they knew it was going to be followed by a masculine gender noun. When they saw the hay, that's the diacritical mark, when they saw the hay, they, that was the, they knew it was going to be followed by a feminine noun. And when they saw toe, they knew they could tell what gender something was by looking at the definite article. You understand what I'm saying? They could tell what they're fixing to talk about simply by looking at the definite article. And we don't have that, do we? We just got T-H-E. That's all we got. We're very limited. Now, but you got to remember, they would translate sometimes. They do this in the interlinear Bible. Out of the Greek text, you'll have whole oh, sometime will be he or him. Te will be him or her, and to will be it or that or whatever. And you'll have the same thing over here because you got masculine and feminine and neuter gender in the auto, in the auto. So even though it says him, it means self. Him, put it this way. When they would say this, they'd mean, they'd mean him that is self. When Jesus rebuked him, he rebuked A-U-T-O. That's the way it's spelled in that verse. What it was saying in the Greek was Jesus rebuked him that is self. It is the self of that man. That's what he was rebuking. I hope you're going to get a hold of that. Now, we're, we're also looking at, we have, we got three other words for deceive. Three other words, 40C, and you have the words, you have, you have other words, you have like gal, dulos, and you have other words like that, that have the idea of deception, but we're only talking about the words that have been translated deceive or deceived. You have the word apate, apate, apatao, A-P-A-T-E-O. And apatao, the word ending, is changed due to the character. Apatao is the verb, and apate is the noun, deceive. Apate would be like deception. Deception or delusion. Those are nouns. A delusion is something you've been convinced into believing. 
It's a state of mind. It's you're deluded. But apatao is the verb, and that would be a word meaning to cheat, to delude, or deceive. So this is the verb. And then you have ex apatao. Now what we've done, we've already, this means to deceive completely, to deceive completely, ex. And we've already gone through apatao, and we're going, we've already gone through this. So I'm going to, I'm going to do this. We've already gone through in previous weeks on this one, of the verb. Now we're looking at the noun, the noun apate. And we've gone through and we've taken ourselves over to, we're talking about what is it that leads people away into sin? What leads them off into, into uh, false doctrine and causing them to live wrong as believers? Well, we've worked our way down to in Apate. We've worked our way down to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Let's go back over there. It's hard for me to get through the fourth chapter of Ephesians because it is truly a false doctrine chapter. The chapter is not false doctrine, but it's exposing false doctrine. Now, we said last week, and this has gone through my mind all week long. Mike said he liked that message last Sunday night better than anything I'd done in years. And uh, we're talking about people who listen to winds of doctrine in verse 14. Men try to fool Believers, by the slight of men, slight, cubia, means to have the, have used trickery and diverting your attention just like a man who uses sleight of hand or a magician. And cunning craftiness where they, they lie in wait to deceive. And then he goes on down here and he talks about, first of all, he talks about how we should live and then he talks about how we shouldn't live. And he says we're not to be like the Gentiles who walk in the vanity of their mind in verse 17. He wouldn't say that if it wasn't possible for believers to do that. He's warning believers in this book. And then he says, here's what happens if you walk in the vanity of your mind following the winds of doctrine, listening to everything that comes along. You have to become educated in the word. If you don't, you're a candidate to be deceived and carried over here by some good feeling doctrine that tells you you can have all the money you want and all you have to do is send all your money to one of these uh, high rolling preachers and then God has to, God's obligated to give you back, back to you and that's all a lie. In verse 18, having the understanding darkened. Now this is what happens. This is going to happen when you get off and you're deceived in sin. Your understanding, your intellect, your ability to see and understand, your ability to have deep thoughts about truth is going to get dark. And you'll be alienated from the spiritual life that's in God through your own ignorance, through your agnoia, through your not knowing agnoia. comes from gnosis placing the alpha in front of gnosis uh, negative particle translates agnoia and we get the word agnostic from that means not to know because of the blindness the word blindness means stupidity of your heart your heart gets stupid and it doesn't understand when you listen to the winds of doctrine as a believer then he says you get to a place where you're past feeling where well, you're apathetic, the word means apathetic, salgia, and you've given themselves over to lasciviousness. That means wantonness. When you're wanton, you have unrestrained sin. You do not hold yourself back from anything. If a believer listens to false doctrine because it feels good, he'll end up in unrestrained sin. If you'll know, if you'll notice. These big superstar mega preachers, they all have sex problems. They all have, they have 
problems with their personal lives. A lot of them have drinking problems. A lot of them have drug problems. Paul Crouch had sexual problems. He had, he was uh, messing around uh, homosexually with some of the people. And they paid off this one guy four hundred and something thousand dollars to keep his mouth shut, and he didn't. And that's why Paul Crouch's son left the ministry up there was because his father was. I don't call it a ministry, but it's all false doctrine. But that's why he left, because his father was messing with some men up there. Of course, Paul Christ just died, and I don't believe he went to heaven. I believe he went to hell. Then he says, you'll get involved in all kinds of wanton, unrestrained sexual living, drug living, drinking living, doing all kinds of debaucherous things. And all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ... If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. I I, I went too far. I need to. No, wait a minute. It's in the next verse. And so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation. Put off does not mean like some people think. Put it off one day. You cannot put off the outer man one day. The reason for the trials and the fire and the persecution, Paul said we got two men in us in Romans 7. We got an outer man that serves the flesh and inner man that serves the law of God. And over the years, the outer man is going to be subdued by the inner man and he's going to have to give up and surrender over to God. If you are a believer, you're going to have to surrender that temper, that... uh, excessive uh, amount of anger and fury and rage and that has to go he says putting off over a period of time concerning now I'm, I need to look up the word put off and look up the verb but I'm quite sure uh, it is a verb that carries the action continually because you can't put off the former conversation all at once you can't put off all the sin in your life all at once and Christ puts all the sin away of the inner man. That's the only perfect man you have in you. But this, when you were born again, I said it this morning, was your flesh born again? If it was, I've sure missed out because I got this old body of mine. What's happened to me? I didn't get a new body. I'm not going to get a new body until I go be with the Lord. Then he says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt, for thero, rotten, according to the deceitful lust. That word deceitful is apate. There's the next time this word is mentioned, apate. Deceitful lust. That is, you are deluded by lust. You're in the midst of deceit. You're being cheated by wickedness in your life out of a righteous life. Let me give you a a man in the Old Testament that was deceived by deceitful lust. Probably one of the greatest illustrations of one of the most godly men in all of the Bible. I want you to take your Bibles and turn over to the 11th chapter of Second Samuel. Here is the prime, here is a prime example of deceitful lust. Lust will deceive the very best men. Don't think you can get by because you believe in predestination and because you uh, believe that Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and you believe in a daily cross. You can believe in a daily cross and not be carrying one. You can believe in a daily cross. You can believe predestination and be out there living the way you shouldn't live. If you belong to God, he's going to beat you. He's not just going to beat you. He's going to beat you up. He'll beat you bad. Now, here's one of the Bible's prime examples of a believer being deceived. David is the king of Israel. He has been made king. He was ruling in Hebron until uh, until 
the ruler of northern Israel, which was Abner, Saul's Saul's uh, commanding general, and Abner was ruling northern Israel, and David was ruling southern Judah. And then all of Israel came together in the fifth chapter, and they all came and brought David tribute, and and David was bowing to God and doing all the things he was supposed to do. He was a righteous man. He was a man after God's own heart. And if there's an example of deceitful lust, when you think that you cannot be deceived because you're such a good Christian, you're wrong. There's things if we open our minds to, we will become very deceived. Now, probably one of the best examples is David and Bathsheba. David was a godly, righteous king. God set him up in the kingdom in the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. And he wasn't king among the eyes of the people. Saul was king among the eyes of the people. But God had had Samuel come down and anoint David king. And Saul, and Saul stayed king all the way through the end of the book of 1 Samuel through that 30th chapter. He was king of Israel. But when you get into the second Samuel, David is king of, of southern Israel in, he, in Hebron in the second chapter. And then when you get to the fifth chapter, all of Israel accepts him and all the kings from all around the world are coming to Israel to pay David homage. And God is blessing his life. God delivered him from Saul's hand when Saul wanted to kill him. And here David is, a wonderful godly, righteous man whom God loved. And this is his story about deception, about being deceived by lust. Verse 1, chapter 11, 2 Samuel. It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab, his nephew, who was his commanding general. Joab was head of David's armies. He sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon. God was with David. Boy, he, everything David went to. If this was the Mediterranean Sea, and here's Egypt down here, and here's Israel... This is Jordan right here. Well, northern Jordan, what we call Jordan today, was the land of Ammon. And southern Jordan was the land of Moab. These were the two sons of Lot's two daughters when they incestually had a relationship with Lot, supposing that perhaps the seed would come out of them to have a son to be the Messiah. So, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. God was really blessing David. And it came to pass in the evening, or at evening tide, about the time the sun's about to go down, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. He walked out of his bedchamber and walked out on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. She was perhaps on the roof of her house. The roofs are all flat. They had staircases that went up there. They would go up there for the air and the fresh air and the breeze in the evening. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Bathsheba was drop-dead gorgeous. That's what tempted David. Now, David had many wives. He didn't need her. And David sent and inquired after the woman. The first thing he does is he says, Who is that? And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Oh, that's who that is. David was looking at her at a distance, but he knew who she was. 
He had to know who she was because if you look over here at the 23rd chapter, David is numbering the mighty men in his army in the 23rd chapter. The, the book ends in the 24th chapter and then Solomon becomes the king in the next book. David is in his old age here in the 23rd chapter of 2 Samuel. Daniel knew this woman. He didn't know her from afar, but he said, who is that? One said, this is Bathsheba. He said, oh, I know her. He had to know her. Let me show you why. David is naming all his mighty men through this 23rd chapter of 2 Samuel. And he speaks of these people in the 34th, chap 34th verse of the 23rd chapter. Here's some of his great men. Elephelet, the son of Ahashbai, the son of the Machathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite. Ah, Eliam, who is the father of Bathsheba, Eliam is Ahithophel's uh, it's son, and Bathsheba is Ahithophel's granddaughter. Well, who in the world is Ahithophel? Well, if you go over to Second Samuel 15. Go to Second Samuel 15. 15. In verse 12, now Absalom is trying to overthrow his father, who is David. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor. Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grandfather, was David's chief counselor from his city from Gilo. And the Bible speaks of him being the Gilonite. So, Bathsheba's grandfather is David's chief counselor. You can bet that she was, has walked into the palace and David said, you got an attractive granddaughter, Ahithophel. He says, yes, she is. He would say, hi. And she'd say, hi, King David. There's no way that David didn't know her once he knew who she was. He said, who is that woman bathing over there? I have a desire for her. Go back to the chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. What David did was start looking at something he had no business looking at, a woman bathing naked. And this stirred up his passions in him. Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, Oh, she's married besides that. Oh, yes, that Uriah. Is any one of my soldiers in my army? Oh, yes, he's one of your best soldiers, King David. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her sexually. And she was purified from her uncleanness. She returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I'm going to have a baby, and it's yours. Oh, me. Is God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that she shall also reap. She's got a husband who's in battle up here in Ammon fighting the Ammonites. And David's at home here in Jerusalem, and he got... Uriah's wife pregnant, Bathsheba. And people say, I can't come to Grace and Truth Ministries. I've got too much sin in my life. Would you allow the psalmist David to come here? Now, David's going to have to repent of this. But first of all, he's going to commit murder, okay? Before he repents. This is the, what was that he said over there in Ephesians, the fourth chapter? The, you're thinking it, you, the old man is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The lust in you, epithumia, which means to long for that which is forbidden. Was Bathsheba forbidden from David? Yes. 
And the woman conceived and said and told David, sent and told David, I'm with child. And David sent to Joab, his nephew, who's commanding his troops up here in northern section of Ammon. They're at war with the Ammonites. Saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So Joab tells Uriah up there in battle, he says, you go back to David, he's got some particular message for you. When Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did. He thought, I will change the subject and I'll make him think I've got him here for some other reason and that I just want him to report on the battle up there. But David is deceitful and underhanded. When you are deceived, you're going to get deceitful trying to cover up your sin. And how the people did and how the war prospered. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet and spend the night with your wife. Maybe if you spend the night with your wife and you have relations with her, you won't recognize that that baby looks like me when he's born. Now this is King David who wrote the Psalms. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Boy, he is sure trying to doctor up his relationship with Uriah. He don't know what's going to happen. And Uriah slept at the door of the king's house. He didn't go home and sleep with his wife. With all the servants of his Lord and went not down to his house. He didn't go. David said, go home and be with your wife and have an enjoyable night. And after all, you're a wonderful soldier. And here's some extra food. David is flattering Uriah, isn't he? And when they had told David, saying, Uriah didn't go down to his house. David is desperate. What am I going to do? She's going to have my baby. Don't sound like King David who wrote the Psalms, does it? It is. David said unto Uriah, this is the payment. When you are deceived and led away and you get involved in deception, you start deceiving people. Camest thou not from thy journey? Why didn't, didn't you go down to your house and sleep with your wife and get me off the hook? He's thinking that to himself. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents up there in the land of Ammon, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I go into mine house and to eat and drink and lie with my wife when my, when my fellow soldiers are up here at war with the Ammonites? You think I can do that, King David? I can't do that. As, the, as thou livest, as thy soul liveth, I will not do this. That's what I want, but I will not. I want to go home and be with my wife. She is beautiful. And David said to Uriah, Stay here today also, and tomorrow I'll let you depart. Just stay here with me. Boy, David, can you imagine the frustration? How do you get a king of Israel? Well, you get him through his own deceitful lust. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and in the morrow. When David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. He would not go. I cannot do this. All my men are suffering. I can't do it. Uriah was an honorable man, and this is what's eating David alive. He's honorable. I can't enjoy my life while my men are at war. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab. David sits down and says, I got to do something here. So he writes out this letter. 
and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He says, take this to Joab. He's commanding the troops up there. It is a death warrant for Uriah. It is a murder plot. David is plotting the murder of Uriah. This is King David, the wonderful psalmist David. If David can be deceived, this is one of the things that can deceive a man is a woman. Women are beautiful and curvy and men, look to me, look like sticks. I don't understand homosexuals. They, men look like sticks to me. Don't they, Dwayne? I mean, I don't know what a woman loves about a man with a stick. And they're ugly. Huh? And they're ugly. Yeah, and they're ugly, yeah. I cannot imagine kissing on a man. Good grief. That's disgusting. <laughs> Just soon go out and kiss on a pig or something. <laughs> Good night. All right. Now, where was I? All right. And he wrote the letter saying, now this is a letter written to Joab, David's commander, who's up here in northern Ammon. David's down here in Jerusalem. He's called for Uriah, brought him down to Jerusalem, and he's going to send Uriah with a letter back to Joab, his commander. He says, here's what I want you to do with Uriah. He wrote a letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire from him. Withdraw from him so he's alone with the enemy that he may be smitten and die. David is not any different in this place here than some mafia mob head putting a contract because David was the head, wasn't he? He was the king. Then putting a contract uh, on a hit in in a mob. David was doing the same thing, wasn't he? And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. Valiant is the word kail. It means virtuous men it's that same word that's used for wealth. Uh, I don't need to get into that. That'd be the spiritual spiritual wealth. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died in that battle. And David set him up to die. David had Uriah killed. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messengers saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matter of war unto David the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he send to thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight, knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote? Abimelech, the son of Jerebosheth, did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye up nigh unto the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So David is chastising them for going up too close to the wall of the enemy, and he's the one that sent them there. See, he's trying to sound like he is innocent. He's trying to divert the attention. You know what he's doing? We're talking about a wonderful man of God and how far away you can get away from God as a believer. Absolute power corrupt. Through, through lust. Well, what corrupted him was deceitful lust. Remember, idolatry, idololatria, means to serve what you see. And David was looking at the wrong thing. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us in the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. 
and the shooters shot from the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Well, David knew that was going to happen. He didn't even have to be informed of that. He was trying to chew them out for getting too close to the end of the wall of the enemy because they're going to shoot from the top of the wall. You remember Abimelech, the son of Gideon, was killed by a person when he got too close to the wall. A woman came up and hit him in the head with a stone, and that's what Abimelech said. Somebody run me through with a spear. I don't want it to be said that Abimelech was killed by a woman. That's what Abimelech said. That's the truth. He said, and he was Gideon's son, and Abimelech was a scoundrel. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thee battle, make thy battle more strong. What are we talking about? We're talking about how a believer can be deceived. And there is payment for, for falling into deception to every believer. One as well as another, make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah, who is who? Bathsheba, this beautiful knockout woman, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. <coughs> she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was over with, when she quit mourning, David sent and fetched her to his house. She's going to have a son. Now, the one she's going to have is going to die. Let me show you something here. Go to Galatians, the sixth chapter. We're going to come right back to this place. Galatians, the sixth chapter. This don't just, this verse isn't just for unbelievers this is for everybody Galatians 6 verse 7 be not deceived be not deceived don't be led away into into deception God is not mocked God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Moses chose to endure the affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. David, at one point, after he's going to have Uriah murdered, commit adultery with his wife, he's going to take his wife into his house. What amazes me, God works all things after the counts of his own will. Now, the baby she has is going to die while it's a baby. As soon as it's born, it gets real sick, and it's going to die. But David's going to have a son later on by Bathsheba, and his name is Solomon. And Solomon will build the temple of God. And Now, here's what really, when you're talking about the sovereignty of God, I can't get this off. You're talking about the sovereignty of God. Solomon is going to build the temple. His mother is Bathsheba. Do you think that God set up Solomon to build the temple of God starting in that sixth chapter of of 1 Kings all the way through the ninth chapter? Do you think that temple was planned before the foundation of the world? Do you think it was planned for Solomon to build it? Well, Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. Huh. You think that somehow this was all in the sovereign will of God for David to commit this murder and adultery? Does God approve of murder and adultery? No. Boy, this is where the rubber meets the road on the sovereignty of God. You believe it because God says it. You don't try to figure out, well, I just don't think God would do that. Well, he did. Now, he says, he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap 
life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for we, in due season, we shall reap if we faint not, if we don't relax. Now back over here to David. Now he's brought Bathsheba to his house. You say, if this is all the will of God, then I get to go sin. David's life from here to the end of his life is nothing but misery. He, he's a wonderful man of God. And that first child that he had that was out of wedlock and adultery died. Well, that's what I'm getting to. Will you let me finish this? I just said that. Now, verse 1, chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan the prophet unto David. Now, Nathan is David's prophet. Every one of these kings had a prophet that would come to him and tell them what they were doing wrong and why they should do this or that. Samuel was also a prophet of David. But Nathan at this time is David's prophet. The Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, David, I've got to tell you a story. Standing in the court of the king, there were two men in one city. The one was rich and the other one was poor. Now, this is the prophet standing in David's court. Just picture this. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought, bought and nourished up. And this one little ewe lamb grew up together with him and with his children. He did eat of his own meat. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock. He wouldn't take of his own flock to kill one of his own sheep for this food for the stranger, and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming him, but he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. David got into a rage. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man that did this. And he said to David, As the Lord liveth the man that hath done this thing, he shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity on this man. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. And David is broken hearted. You see, David had all of these wives, all these beautiful women, and he had to have this one little ewe lamb, Bathsheba. David is reaping what he's sowing. And Nathan said to David, you're the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul when he was trying to kill you. All through the first book of 1 Samuel, from the 16th chapter to the end, Saul was after him trying to kill him. Thought he stole his kingdom. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. I pulled the kingdom together into one nation for you, David. And if it had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. I would have given you everything, God says. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You killed Uriah the Hittite. You murdered him, King David. You murdered him with the sword as though you plunged it into his heart yourself. And you have taken his wife to be your wife. And you've slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You did the killing. It may have been the Ammonites that jumped on him, but you put him in the heat of battle and had the troops withdraw from him so he had to die. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house. You should underline that. You should highlight that in yellow. And you should underline that 
three or four times and read, the sword will never leave your house, David, and from this point, it never leaves his house. David is miserable the rest of his life. He's still God's king. God still loves him. And David is very, very repentant. The sword will never leave your house because thou hast despised me, has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of your own house. And from this day forward, David has nothing but a hard time till the day he dies. And when he goes to Solomon and says, I go the way of all the earth, it's time to die. I have had enough. Solomon, I'm leaving all this in your hands. I'm going to leave Joab in your hands. I'm going to leave your older brother, uh, Adonijah, in your hands. I'm going to leave Shemai. I'm getting out of here. And he dies. And your own house, I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie sexually with your wives, David, in the sight of all Israel. And that happens. His son, just a few chapters later, his son, Absalom, goes and looks at the mirror, has these long locks. He says, you're a good-looking guy, and you're standing out here at the gate of the city and shaking heads with everybody. Everybody tells you how handsome you are and how beautiful you are. You need to be the king. Run your father out of town. And he does. And before he does, here's what Absalom does. Now, Hithophel <coughs> is David's chief, <coughs> David's <coughs> chief counselor. Let me get a drink of water. <coughs> <clears throat> all right now let's look over here <clears throat> let's see where this prophecy takes place look at look in chapter 16 <clears throat> this is <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um Got some phlegm in my throat. Let me get some water. All right. Now, he says, I'm going to take your wives. I'm going to have your neighbor, which is your own son, to take your wives sexually in the sight of all of Israel because of what you've done. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. When you fall into sin, you're going to pay. I pay for a lot of my sin that I was in years ago with my bad health. It's getting better, but that's because God has caused me to commit my life to Him. I won't ever be like I was when I was young, but I've gone through a lot of years of ill health. When you look at Second Samuel 16, this is where Shammai, as David is leaving town, Shammai is throwing stones at him. We'll get to that later. In verse 20 of chapter 16 of 2 Samuel. Verse 20. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, David's chief counselor. Now in the meantime here, Ahithophel who advised David. Ahithophel was one of David's closest friends. In fact, the 55th Psalm was written about Ahithophel. We'll talk, we'll look at that in a minute. And Ahithophel, then said Absalom to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we shall do. He was a war counselor. He was a counselor for the economy of Israel. He was David's chief counselor. He's the man that David would go to. The president has an advisor. He has someone he trusts. If Ahithophel, he trusted more than anyone. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left, to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father, 
Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house. And Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. You see, what David has sowed, he's reaping. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. It was as though Ahithophel's counsel, he was a wise old man, and everyone listened to Ahithophel. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with his son Absalom, when his son is at war with him. We're talking about what happens when you get involved in deceitful lusts. This is one of the prime examples in all the Bible. One of the most righteous, godly men in all the Bible got involved in his lust and he committed murder and adultery. If this can happen to David, you think it might happen to one of you or me along the way? Only The only way you're deceived is because you're not properly learned in the word. Now let's go back over here to this 12th chapter. What happens to David to begin with? Well, the sword's never going to leave his house. The sword of God will not leave. Verse 12 of chapter 12 of Second Samuel. For that is in sickly. What you did, David, this is Nathan still talking to him. What you did, you did secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This ought to be underlined. David was completely repentant. In fact, the 51st Psalm is written about David's repentant heart concerning his affair with Bathsheba. I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't say it was her fault. She shouldn't have been out there bathing naked. It's not what he was saying. He said, I have sinned. Well, she's part of this. No. If you're repentant, you will take the total blame. It matters not if someone else is part of that. You will take all the blame. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also shall put away thy sin. You're not going to die because you're repentant, David. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child that Bathsheba is carrying and is born unto thee is going to die. I'm going to see to it. And Nathan departed unto the house and the Lord struck the child. The Lord struck the child. People say, well, God wouldn't hurt anybody. God struck this child with a deathly illness. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. Notice it keeps talking about her and calls her Uriah's wife. And it was very sick. And David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth, just mourning over the sick child. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with him. He didn't want to eat whenever you're going through a mourning process. You're just not hungry. And it came to pass on the seventh day that this child that Bathsheba had born died. And the servants of David were afraid to go tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto David. He would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. They knew He knew they were dead because they're over here on the side of the, uh, the big hallway or the big uh, uh, canopy of marble in the, in the temple or in the David's castle or palace. Therefore David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel 
and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped, then came to his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. And said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child is dead, you stop fasting, you stop weeping, and you rose and ate bread. And David said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me and the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now there's a baby that died. People try to put babies in hell. That's not true. The wages of sin is death. Everyone has to suffer for their own sin. The scripture tells us repeatedly in the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, and the list goes to the 25th chapter of Second Chronicles. The Bible says you have to die for your own sin. Babies, unless a baby knows how to sin, they can't go to hell. It's not until they come to the knowing right and wrong, good and evil, that they go straight to evil, and the first sin that they commit is what condemns them to hell. Now, David, now what was it Nathan said? He said, just because David, just because David is all repentant doesn't mean that he's off the hook. Because Nathan said, the sword will never leave your house. Didn't he say that? When you go into the next chapter, David's got an older son. His name is Ammon, or Amnon. And we read about Amnon over in the first part of this book when the Bible's speaking of the sons of David in verse 2 of chapter 3 of Second Samuel. And unto David were, was born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, his secondborn Kiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Gersher, and the fourth Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and so forth. These are David's sons. Well, when you get over here to the 13th chapter, you're going to see that what Nathan said is going to come true and it's going to come true for the rest of David's life. How do you get to the king of Israel when God is on his side? God is saying, David, you have to pay for what you've done. Hey, Jim, if David was completely repentant, why did he treat the Ammonites so unmercifully by putting them to saws and sawing them apart? And cutting them well, we're not going to go into that right oh. now. You're wanting to get into a whole different subject. David was repentant, but David, it's not a lack of repentance to kill the enemy, not with God. When God would tell David to do something, he would go in and slaughter, so did Saul. But that wasn't an evil thing to kill the enemy, not with God. Now, when you get into the 13th chapter, Remember, Absalom and Amnon are David's sons. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved Tamar. But Tamar was Absalom's full sister. Wasn't, wasn't Amnon's full sister, but was Absalom's. And Amnon loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he felt sick for his sister. This is David's children, Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything unto her. So Amnon starts plotting. Maybe he learned some of this from his father, David. It sounds like as you're going through here, that David is a sinner, but he's not. He's a righteous man. He is repentant. He said, I have sinned. 
you're not going to get rid of all sin when you're repented, are you? David's, David is a man. But as far as Bathsheba, he's completely repentant. Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, make thyself sick, and he recruits someone to help him commit this sin. When you get deceived, you'll go out and recruit somebody to help you. Now, this is part of David's payment for what he's done, isn't it? Make thyself sick, and when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So Ammon lay down and made himself sick when the king was come to him. Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Now remember, we're talking about the sword not leaving the house of David. These are David's kids turning into rebellion, but this is the judgment of God upon David, isn't it? This gets real twisted in here. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, thinking he was sick. And he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. Well, because he's not hungry, he's hungry for her body. And Amnon said, have out all the men, get all the men out of here. And they went out every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. He's still tricking her. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber and Ammon, her brother, to Ammon, her brother, Amnon, he's a half-brother to her. Full brother, she's full brother, uh, she's full sister to Absalom. And when she had brought them in to him to eat, he grabbed her and took hold of her and said, You come lie with me, my sister. She said, Nay, my brother, no, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. I whither shall I cause my shame to go, and as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Howbeit, he would not hearken to her voice. He was stronger than her. And he forced her, and he took her, and he raped her. This is his sister, his half-sister. Now, Absalom gets the words. And when David heard about this in verse 21, he was very wroth, and Absalom spake unto his brother, Amnon, neither good or bad. Amnon, Absalom is keeping his mouth shut. Not going to say nothing. For Absalom hated Amnon, but he didn't want him knowing anything about it. So he's not going to raise his voice. He's not going to correct him for what he did because he had forced his sister Tamar. He had raped her. And it came to pass after two full years. You think Absalom has forgot about this? This man is bent on revenge. It's two years later after the rape, that Absalom had sheep shears and Baal Hazor, which is beside Ephraim, 
And Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shears. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. And the king said to Absalom, Nay, not so, my son, I, I can't go. Let us not all go, go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressured him, howbeit David wouldn't go. They're going to this festival. But he blessed him. Then said Absalom, and Absalom, and I believe Absalom knew David couldn't go being the king, that he had pressing matters. So Absalom says to the king, I pray thee, father, let my brother Amnon go with us. He's setting up, he's setting it up, premeditated murder of his brother. You know what all this is about? All of this is about what we talked about earlier. This is judgment on David's life for what he did. And the king said unto him, Why should Amnon go with you? And Absalom pressured David that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark you now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, when I say unto you, smite Amnon and kill him, don't be afraid. Have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. I'm the king's son. I'm telling you to kill my brother Amnon. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. And it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to David, saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons. Well, that wasn't true. And there is not one of them left. Then the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. And Jonadab, the son of Shemia, David's brother, answered and said, Let not the Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons. Ammon only is dead. This is revenge for what Ammon did to Tamar when he raped her. The sword never left David's house. He has a hard time the rest of his life. He was at such peace. When you read First Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11 up to chapter 11 David was the king of Israel everything was peace and quiet in Israel his enemies were subdued and he got involved in deceitful lust and that destroyed the rest of his peaceful life now this is not the end of all of this Amnon only is dead, for by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Now, Absalom has to leave town. He flees in verse 37, went to Talmai, and he's hiding out from David because he's afraid that David's going to have him killed. But David loves Absalom. And then you get on up to the 16th chapter, and Absalom decides that he needs to be, actually up in this 15th chapter, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel in verse 6, and he's out there at the edge of the city welcoming people and telling them how wonderful they are. And Absalom steals the hearts of the people in Israel. So from this point, Absalom tries to take over the kingdom. And he gets his army together. He runs his father out of town. His father flees north with his three super generals, Joab, Abishai, and Ittai the Gittite. And then Absalom is killed in that slaughter. And Joab, David's nephew, kills Absalom, David's son. And this is one family member after another raping and killing and destroying. And this is what happened to David's life. And David goes all the way through the rest of his life through the end of this book. 
and says, I'm tired. And when you enter into the first kings, David is old man and his life is just, you know, something. You're not going to accomplish all the great things you're going to. You'll just turn out to be an old man or old woman and it's time to die. And that's what happened with David. And David paid for his sin the rest of the way for the rest of his life. That's what deceitful lust did to David. But he's not the only one. Look over here in 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. Solomon is a wonderful man of God. He loves God with all of his heart. Loves God. He starts building this temple here, uh, the, the temple, and it's going to be Solomon's temple in chapter 5 and 6. They're kind of blended together there. He finishes the temple up in chapter 9. And Solomon is a wonderful man of God, but he is also Bathsheba's son. The one died, and Solomon lives. In chapter 9, in verse 1, it came to pass, Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he had pleased to do. And the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him in Gibeon. And he speaks good to Solomon. And then you get down to the 11th chapter. I don't understand believers. I don't even understand myself the way I have lived in my past and walked away from God and got involved in sin. Now Solomon... God has spoken to Solomon and told him, I'm going to give you wealth and riches and honor because you've asked for wisdom to rule these people. And in chapter 11, now remember, Solomon finishes building the temple with the blessing of God in the ninth chapter. Here you are over in the 11th chapter, and Solomon gets involved, just like his father, in deceitful lusts. How much time do they have, Mike? We'll just read this. King Solomon loved many strange women. Strange does not mean weird. The word is nokri, N-O-K-R-I-Y. Now, we're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about believing godly men that are led away by deceitful lusts. Strange means foreign. Adulterous or alien women, adulterous when it comes to God, they worship other gods. King Solomon loved many adulterous, strange, alien women who worshipped idol gods. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moab, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, Solomon married a bunch of heathens of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely if you go in to these pagan women, they will turn away your heart after their gods. Now this is true in our daily life. We're not to be unequally yoked. We're to come out and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. We're not to live with uncleanness and marry not just women, but marry our lives to other people who don't believe God. You'll go after their gods. If their God is money, they'll teach you to go after money. If their God is pulling away from the church and having fun and enjoying their life without living a godly, righteous life, they'll cause you to do that. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, He married the women that God told the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. They'll turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princes, and 300 concubines. And Solomon's heart was turned away from the Lord. 
That's what deceitful lust. He was a king. He could have him a hair. I mean, he had one. He had a thousand women in it. And it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. Now that's amazing. He said Solomon's heart, the scripture says Solomon's heart wasn't perfect as would David his father. So evidently God has forgiven David even though he brought all of this upon his life. You know what I believe God was doing to David when he brought all these sons uh, turning against him and killing one another and raping the daughters? I believe God was maturing David. That's what he was doing. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the, all the female deities, the goddess of the Zidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord because he liked all these good-looking women. As did David his father, he was deceived by deceitful lust. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemash, that was the sun god of Moab, or the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burned incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And had commanded him concerning now God came and appeared. I believe that was Jesus pre incarnate came and spoke to Solomon in person. Abraham saw Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus said so. Moses saw the backside of Jesus before he was called Jesus. Can you imagine Solomon talking to God personally and then doing this? We have the word of God here that speaks to us, and yet men go out in America and do everything else in, after claiming to be godly Christians and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as that this is done of thee, and thou hast kept, not kept my covenant, my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and give it unto thy servant. And that's Rehoboam. And because of Solomon's deceitful lust, God splits the kingdom into two kingdoms. Spits into northern Israel and southern Judah. And he does this in the, in the next chapter with the son of, of Solomon, just like God brought the judgment on David through his children. So Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, takes some bad advice from his high school buddies, and God splits the kingdom, splits it into northern Israel and southern Judah. And I have preached on northern Israel and southern Judah so many times, and we'll cover all that when we go through this book. I'm just about out of time. So, if you look over here in Nehemiah, Nehemiah. Nehemiah reminds the people of what Solomon did. It's amazing to me what men will do in knowing that judgment will come as believers, and yet they continue to do it. Look here in Nehemiah. Nehemiah. The last chapter. Last chapter. Verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Well, he says in verse 25 that Nehemiah goes down to contend with the people because they're intermarrying with these pagan women. And in those days, in verse 23... In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod. This is the children of Israel and their children, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. 
All these children in Israel could do was speak in a pagan language. And the Bible was not even translated into pagan languages back then. Therefore, the children of the children of Israel could not even hear the truth of God. And then he says in verse 20, well, it says in verse 25, I contended with them, I cursed them. This is what Nehemiah was doing. And smote certain of them and plucked out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like Solomon? who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even did outlandish women cause Solomon to sin with all of his brilliance and his wisdom. No man can handle temptation. No woman. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God, in marrying strange wives, can you marry your life to lies? There is reward. It's not a good reward. There, you're gonna, you're gonna get due recompense for what you do. And that, and he's talking about believers. Can you see that Solomon? There's one other man over in Judges thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. And he was deceived by deceitful lust. His name was Samson. Samson was a good man of God, and God was with him, God loved him. But he liked to chase pagan women. He wanted Delilah because she was good looking. And that woman was a witch. You have to understand that God rewards us all for what we do. And there is a deceitful lust. Am I out of time, Mike? One minute. How long? One minute. One minute. I'm going to come back. I wanted to go through Samson because if you look over there in the 13th chapter of Judges, 13th chapter, you'll see this. You can read through this yourself. Judges 13. There was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord comes to the woman and says, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son and he'll not drink any wine nor strong drink nor eat any unclean thing. He was going to be a Nazarite from the womb, just like John the Baptist. And no razor will come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Well, after, after Samson is born, you get over here into the 14th chapter, and he starts getting mixed up with the daughters, with a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Immediately, Samson starts running around with a Philistine idol-worshiping woman. And Samson has to pay with his life. And these are all three godly, righteous men who got off in their sin. And people say believers can't get off in their sin. Well, you tell God that about David and about Solomon and about Samson. I've run out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, I pray you'll, I pray for the church continually, Lord, that they'll mature, that they'll live in truth. They won't follow out here in the way and get involved in deceitful lust, whether it's, sexual or whether it's money or drugs it's real easy lord to fall into these things in this day and time i pray for the flock and i i pray you'll mature the people let me say the words that'll cause them to realize there's payment for sinful living lord i pray you'll 
lead us in everything we do, open up many doors for the church, and God lead us to your elect. In Christ's name we pray, amen.